Happy New Year! Um, it is the 1st of January. Um, I've got to admit, it's morning and I do not feel that fresh. So if I sort of glaze over, that's what's going on. <laughs> but uh, this morning I am sowing chilli seeds because it is finally 2021. I've got so many to sow this year, I'm really excited about chilies and peppers and aubergines. Uh, I actually ordered a load of aubergine seed um, about three or four days ago um, in a panic that I didn't have any. You know, when you get that kind of like the seed sweats when you don't think you have enough. And then yesterday when I was looking through the chilli seeds, I realised that I put all the aubergine seeds in with the chilli seeds. Very sensible because they need to be sown at the same time. But it did mean that I've now got twice as many aubergine varieties as I thought I did. Never mind. Basically loads of aubergines, loads of chilies. I'm probably not going to sow them all with you this morning because we'll be here for like two hours and nobody needs that. What I really need is uh, to go back to bed, but this is the priority. So anyway, yeah, happy new year. Oh, it's really needed. It's like just refilling my brain. I've also got the um, questions from you from, hang on, let me just get the compost. Yeah, I've also got the um, questions that I put out. Thank you very much. I've got loads of questions. I was only expecting a few. So just as I'm doing this, we'll just go through them, I think. I'm using a um, mixture of compost and vermiculite as per normal. It's not very well mixed, but never mind. And I'm also using, this is not the ideal setup, but it's really miserable outside. So I don't really want to do this in the rain. Yeah, the pots I'm using are these little individual ones. They are going to go into a heated propagator, so I'll probably do them in two batches. So I'll do one lot today and then I'll do another lot once these ones have germinated because once they've germinated, they don't need to be in the heated propagator any longer. So we keep our heated propagators actually in the sitting room, but I'm probably going to keep them up here this time around because I'm not short of a plug up here. And we'll keep them in there. They do not need light to germinate, but that's part of the reason that I'm sowing them in individual pots rather than in trays because the different chilies will germinate at different rates and I want to be able to take them out of the heat once they're germinated and put them straight into the light. Now I don't have any, um, what are they called? I don't have any grow lights. I should have grow lights and I've thought about it. And I've been contacted by a couple of companies over the last year or so about, you know, they want to provide me with grow lights to do something or what other, but I always feel really uncomfortable about then having to kind of promote them. And then what, what if they're crap, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure what to do, but these two trays do not fit in my heated tray propagator things. So, but I'm using these as I'm sewing them to put them in because otherwise I'm just clearly going to like knock them all over. So these are just for support and then I will hook them out and put them individually into the heated bed. Yes, that is the plan. So I guess questions. While I'm filling these up, what do we have? We have got since growing chili peas, do 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 do. Uh, Wesley is asking about aphids on chilli plants. Now, touch MDF, I have not had a problem with aphids on chilli plants before. Um, normally by the time they go up to the allotment, they're really quite big plants. They're normally about this big and quite strong. And then they get planted straight into the polytunnel. Uh, I have had problems with aphids on pretty much everything else. Um, so, but basically he's saying he gets ladybird lava in and that's basically all you can do. When they're on your seedlings and things, when in the propagation areas, if you see an aphid, just squash it. 
like that's just get them really early because if they get stuck in and they start sticking their little suckers in to the really really young new plants most of the time they just never recover so yeah that was a good question wasn't it because i don't really have an answer to that I realised that this is going to be really tricky for continuity because I was planning to kind of just record this, have a chat and then like edit a load of it. But we're going to be seeing like half the pots full and then only two pots full and it's going to be really, it's going to be really tricky. So sorry about that. If you see like the pots jumping around, that's what's going on. I'm cutting out me talking rubbish. So what else have we got? Ah, what are the other plot holders like at your allotment? I never really hear you talk about them. You never hear me talk about them because quite a few of them watch the program and that would be well awkward if I just started like chatting about what they were up to. Uh, we have quite a good setup. We're on quite a small site actually. There's only 48 full size plots and about half of those have been divided. So yeah, there's about 75 plots I'd say on our site, which isn't that many. And a lot of people, it's one of those sites where you've got people who've been on there a very, very long time. So, yeah, we have quite a good, it's quite a lot of exchange happens between, between allotment sites. Um, obviously, this year things have been quite a lot different because there would normally be, you know, somebody puts a, um, what they call like incinerator on or had a bonfire or something. And then um, there's a chap up the way who used to always have a bottle of wine in his um water butt you know and it was quite jolly but obviously this year has changed the way things happen on the allotments we do normally in other years we have quite a lot of people on the allotment like coming for a drink or whatever particularly when we were having a bonfire can't have bonfires anymore which is a bit of a bugger but yeah so in normal years it's quite it's quite jolly quite friendly this year's just been slightly different but i'm not you won't hear me kind of chatting about my allotment neighbours basically <laughs> in case they're watching okay we've got David is asking what new am I going to be growing this year so over the years I've grown most things there's always something new and this year I'm going to try edible lupins um never grown them before grown lupins before not very successfully though to be honest um but yeah edible lupins apparently they are just like a dried bean uh because obviously lupins in the pea family if you think of their flowers so yeah that's what i'm growing new this year and I'm pretty excited about it to be honest and the other thing i'm growing this year is the field beans I've grown them for green manure before but i've never grown them to eat and because i got pretty overexcited with the whole thing i've got so many beds of them I think what I'm going to do is leave at least half of one bed to go to fruit or bean or whatever you want to call it um, so we can actually taste what they taste like because they are just a broad bean um, but they've got they've been bred not for the size and taste of their bean they've been bred for the root activity so they're just smaller I think but they're also a lot tougher so it'd be interesting like if you find it really difficult to overwinter broad beans I think they would be a really good option, but uh, I will tell you how they taste when I get there. Uh, Vino Govinda says, I'm new to gardening and would like more info on pest control, organic way, especially slugs, caterpillars and aphids. Well, I've got bad news for you. It's just a constant battle. Um, and it's if you're going the organic way, it's you're not going to be spraying nasties around, which is obviously the right the right way to go, go organic. But um, yeah, basically it's just a battle, and it's preventative. So things like caterpillars netting, stop the butterflies getting to the plants. They're not going to lay their eggs. You're not going to get the caterpillars. So that's one really important thing to do. Slugs is a bit more tricky. Um, we have years where we have terrible slug problems and then other years when they just don't seem to sort of make much of an impact. I guess that's to do with the dry weather. Um, but we put, um, cause you know, I've got the raised beds. We have sort of old roof slate tiles, you know, and if you lean one up against the edge of the bed, so it's just forming a little dark damp patch. If you lean them up there, 
come back in the morning, particularly in the summer, flip it over. It's just loads and loads and loads of them under there. So, um, yeah, and then you just have to get rid of them. But then what do you do? I mean, I know some people cut them in half, you know, go at them with the secateurs or whatever. I just can't bear it. So, um, a couple of years running, mum has bagged them all up in a plastic bag. And then we take them down on our walk home. We go past a couple of like litter bins, uh, particularly dog poo bins, because there's quite a few parks around near us. And I mean, I think, I mean, slugs love dog poo. So I think that we're probably just putting them somewhere that they really enjoy, but they're not going to come back because it's far enough away. So but yeah, basically I've got bad news for you. Uh, it's just trial and error and see what works for you and keep going with it. You, you're never going to kind of get rid of them if you're, if you're planning to do an organic approach to it. It's just, you're just putting yourself there that you're working with nature, not against it. And you're going to have to accept that some things are going to be lost by pests and diseases. It's only when they get sort of too many of, of something that you've got to really kind of step in. But generally it's learning to live with it. What else have we got? Oh, Alex from the Essex Allotment is after a plug. He says, what other gardening YouTube's channel do you watch? Well, obviously you, Alex. Obviously you. <laughs> So Philip Wood's saying he's just got an allotment. How long has it taken you to get your plot to where it is now? Well, we've had our plot a long time, um, but it does go through lots of different permutations. So we've had the beds in sort of different, different places and uh, the last two years, I've basically replaced everything. Um, done so much work over the last two years because I've been back home. So I've moved the shed. We basically flipped the allotment from one side. We had the shed and everything at one end, compost at the other, and then we've just flipped the whole lot going the other way. So fruit cages come up the top end, shed's gone down the bottom end, compost bins have all been moved. We enlarged the pond. I built the poly tunnel, the chicken house. We've built a run for them at the front. I've replaced all the fence down the side. So it's just a never ending kind of evolution of the space. At the allotment at the moment, we've really got things kind of where they want to be. We're not going to be moving anything else massively for a long time. I can tell you that much. But you say um, spending a lot of time clearing the site. Yeah, that is inevitably the first bit. But if you're going down the raised, as you ask also, uh, where do I stand on no dig? Well, I mean, it's a bit of a tricky one because the, the title no dig is like a big thing but actually if you use if you're a raised bed grower anyway particularly small rose beds like that you don't dig um, and we haven't dug for well decades um, but what I have learned from Charles Dowding and all that kind of thing is actually the quantity of compost that you have to put on each year to really get it to go well otherwise the soil does suffer our soil suffers uh, because we're on sand so the nutrients wash out really really fast and if you're not kind of digging stuff in which is the traditional way of doing it you do actually have to put really quite a substantial amount of compost or manure or mulch or whatever it is you're doing to to put into the soil so but no we don't dig anything I mean I'm not um, evangelical about it in the sense that if I've got a massive root or I need to dig something out, I will dig. I'm not um, kind of overly precious about it, but yeah, basically on the hall, on the hall, basically overall, no, I don't dig anything. I haven't done for years and years and years. Oh, that's interesting. Sarah Pierre says, if you only had four beds, what would you grow in them? I don't know. I've got 19 beds and I'm stressed out that I never have enough space for everything I want to grow. So four beds is a bit of a challenge. But what would I do? I'd say things that you don't need a lot of plant for a lot of output. So things like beans, climbing beans, TP of beans. You can get a lot of bean for a very small amount of ground area. Um, you want plants which are going to produce a lot. So like a broccoli not a good idea you get a lot of plant and a lot of space 
for your one hedge and then you sometimes get a few sprouts but it's not like a cut and come again kind of crop i would have asturian cabbage trees definitely because although they're quite big they just are a constant harvest kale is a similar thing to that like i say beans as long as they're uh, tall beans that's a really good one um quicker crops so turnips as opposed to swede because swede takes a bit longer in the ground um yeah god it's really tricky things that can be grown quite close together is important um so sort of like a cauliflower wouldn't be a very good option um about a year ago right at the beginning of lockdown actually i don't know if you know uh, good hemp they make like hemp milk and stuff they were doing a sustainable food in london project um they asked me to do a bit on kind of choosing what veggie would grow and that was basically my rule was first of all choose something that you actually want to eat uh because if you don't eat a lot of uh chard for example uh don't grow a lot of chard um because it's pointless but secondly anything that's cut and come again or a quick turnover so peas are quite good uh, radishes obviously but some people don't like radishes try cooking them makes a big difference um depends how you feel about it really because fruit would you have fruit in there mm, yeah you see i can't decide what to put in 19 beds i'm just I'm really struggling with the with the four bed concept priority is going to be what you want to eat though isn't it yeah what else have we got um i'd like to know what your favorite tea is or your favorite wine well favorite tea i drink assam generally it's just the best tea around um but on the wine front bad news mum has decided she's doing dry january now, although I haven't decided I'm doing dry January, kind of a knock on effect of her doing dry January is going to be me doing dry January because I'd feel really bad, like just cracking open a bottle of wine without her. And then I'd drink the whole lot rather than just half of it, wouldn't I? So I'd be having a very wet January if I was doing that. So basically I'm doing dry January. So there's not going to be much wine around for the next month, but I do particularly like Ebling at the moment. I'm really into Eblings, so that's that's probably my current favourite. I'm more of a white wine drinker than a red wine drinker, apart from when I'm eating. And to be fair, I'm eating quite a lot of the time, so yeah, both really. <laughs> what else have we got? Hi, Jess. Oh, this is Rusty. What's your propagation setup? Do you use heated propagators, mats, and lights? Uh, I've got. A couple of you know just plug in seed trays that have got the heat mat underneath them so i use that for germination um i would really like to get some lights but i'm being massively indecisive about it like i was saying at the beginning so i haven't got there yet um do you sow and maintain your chili seeds indoors until the warmer weather or are they hardy enough to withstand some cold weather i tried sowing some in april no, always inside with the chilies. They have to be really quite toasty warm to germinate at all, uh, hence the heat mats. And then at this time of year, it's far, far too cold for them outside and you have to start them so early. The reason that it's the 1st of January and I'm sowing the chili plants is because they take such a long time to get to the point where they're gonna be fruiting that you need to start them well early for them to really have given you a good crop before the cold weather hits again at the end of the year. So yeah, they're not an outside plant here. I don't know where you are actually. It doesn't say, but generally even in the summer, I don't grow chilies outside. They are in the polytunnel or the greenhouse and kept inside when they're babies. Yeah, tender little chaps they are, tender. Jay Bark says, hi, I've bought some neem oil, peppermint and citrus oil to help prevent ants making nests in my plant pots and hopefully to stop sap sucking insects. Do I use any of these? Um, I don't use neem oil. If you've watched my vlogs, I went through a bit of a thing with neem oil. I've read some really great stuff about it um, and seen lots of people using it as an organic uh, pesticide and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I bought some 
next and I had to go with it. I sprayed it on some of my beans that were really badly infested with uh, black fly at the time. Um, rather foolishly, I did it the wrong way around that I, um, you know how Google will just throw up sort of what it thinks you want to see. So when I was searching neem oil organic pesticide, I got a lot of information from people and websites about how wonderful it was. And then it was only when I actually searched problems with neem oil that I discovered that it's actually banned in the UK. It's actually really dangerous and it's more dangerous to the bees than that some of the main really chemical components and if you go back i mean it was one of the early vlogs i'd done one vlog where i was talking about how great it was in the meantime i then discovered all this other area i'm not saying it's it's like a definite cut and dry but i discovered there was a whole other area of research that was far less positive about neem oil so then my following vlog was saying okay i'm not using neem oil anymore so um yeah that's how i feel about that um i have used uh, garlic spray on aphids before but to be perfectly honest the aphids attack my garlic so I don't think they're really that intro like they're not afraid of garlic my aphids they're not afraid of anything my aphids I think peppermint oil they'll just smell fresh okay we have got Corin's boy which seeds were you really excited about but they were a complete letdown uh had quite a few of them um Probably the worst one was asparagus peas. What a waste of time and space they are as a vegetable. Beautiful flowers, really lovely looking plants, complete waste of time as a vegetable. It tastes like, it tastes like chewing a stringent cardboard. Doesn't matter if you pick them when they're two centimeters or two inches. Whether you cook them, you don't cook them, whatever you do with them, they're just revolting and such a misleading name. Like they don't taste or look like asparagus and they certainly don't taste like peas. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, there's also, um, have there been any plants that you were ambivalent about before you grew them, but wouldn't be without? Yeah, turnips. Like... I would never have sort of gone to the supermarket and been like, oh God, I've run out of turnips. What am I going to do now? Um, because I just never used them. But geez, they are such a fantastic, versatile, sweet, beautiful little thing. I remember turnips as being a really strong flavour. It was like school dinners. You used to get this kind of like chopped, was it carrot, swede and turnip kind of combo that was utterly revolting. And I kind of had that associated with them, but turnips now, like there's a couple of really beautiful ones. The uh, snowball, is it? And then there's golden ball. God, that's beautiful. Porovsky. Purple top Milan, I never have that much luck with, but still just tastes amazing. Yeah, so them. God, I've been doing a lot of talking. Just realised I go chugging through these questions. I haven't even got onto the chilies. Sorry. Right, where's my chilli box? We have got a lot of chilli to sow. Uh, like I said, I'm going to do one round and then I'm going to do a second round of probably exactly the same, but I don't have that much space in the heated propagators. So in terms of priority chilies, I've got these incredible uh, Turkish sweet peppers that I won. Um, and I've got the KN. KN I'm going to put in today, Anaheim, I've got Nardello peppers from the Heritage Seed Library, thank you very much Heritage Seed Library, uh, they're going to go in, I'm not going to plant those ones because they were crap, I've got saved seed of the black jalapenos, the hot lemon and the orange habaneros, sweet Romano mixed, this was an absolute winner this year. I know I've gone on and on and on about them, but these Frigatello peppers were a gem, absolute gem. So they're going in this year. These are my black jalapeno, lemon drop, orange habaneros. And then all of those are aubergines, I think. Yeah, so I've got a load of these to sew now. And then these are just the ones that come free on the front of, what's it called, Grow Your Own magazine. 
but I'll throw some of them in too. But I might do them in the second sewing, maybe. So what else have we got here? We've got COVID has been ab abhorrent. But do you think it's given you the opportunity to do new things, enjoy simpler things in life and develop your allotment? Yes. Um, COVID has been a disaster zone in so many ways. Um, I really fear for pubs. Um, I mean, I fear for all sorts of businesses, but I have a particular love of proper pubs. And I fear that when it's over, a lot of them are not going to open again. Um, yeah, which I think would be a really sad, sad thing. But I mean, I've really hated the situation with pubs even when they reopened because my idea of a pub is, um, I know some people don't like walking into pubs on their own. I love it. Um, just a pub I don't know. I tend to sit at the bar. So I just, just to get this making me sound like some sort of weird harlot, sort of like trolling the pubs up in town but I do I like it I go I, used to, I spend quite a lot of time in a normal year I spend quite a lot of time in the British Museum and I do quite a lot of writing in there so I kind of be up there around Bloomsbury area and then just wander into a pub sit at the bar have a pint read over what I've been writing that day or whatever and you do you just start conversations with people people start chatting to you and you meet new people in pubs um, that's just how I do it and also my local pub which is just down the road um, because I grew up here and my dad is a big pub goer um like I just you walk in there you're never going to walk into that pub and not know somebody in there which I think is what a pub's about um yeah so the situation with pubs has made me really sad what was I talking about has it given me more time on the allotment yes <laughs> loads more time I mean hang on let me just get a pencil um that has been absolutely incredible. I mean, the amount of time that we spent on the allotment this year has been a record because uh, when the lockdown happened in March, obviously, if you watch the vlogs, you'll know, um, my job just got deleted, basically. It just didn't exist anymore. Um, but how lucky were we that lockdown happened? Like, hang on, I've lost what I'm talking about now. I'm s This chatting and doing thing is a bit tricky. I'm not very good at that. Um, yeah, lockdown happened just as March was kind of rolling in, didn't it? So it was just at the peak, peak, busy springtime. And then I got the whole of spring and summer at the allotment. All I did for that whole time was wake up in the morning, go to the allotment, come back, edit some video and go to bed. And then wake up in the morning and go back to the allotment. I mean, it was bliss. You know, I don't want it to go on forever, but to just be able to have one spring summer season like that, where there is, it's not only that you don't have anything else to do, you can't do anything else, um, was just wonderful. It was, and there was a second half of that question, which was, could you see yourself developing your YouTube channel to provide you a financial income? Well, I can tell you that would be the absolute dream. Um, it just would. I mean, I can't think of anything better than having that situation where my priority is the allotment, filming, chatting to you lot, and uh, and actually being able to survive on it. I mean, I can't think of anything better than that. So, you know, maybe one day we are creeping up on 3,000 followers at the moment, 3,000 subscribers at the moment, which I just think is unbelievable started in March, no, April. I started on Valentine's Day, April the 14th. No, that's February the 14th, Valentine's Day, isn't it? Anyway, April the 14th, I started. I haven't stopped since and I absolutely love it. So the answer to that question is yes, I would love to make a living from doing this. We will see. Rachel Andy, I think it was, asked um, me to go through my cages and how I build them on the allotment. Well, the thing is, is that I don't have a lot of videos and stuff about me building things, although there is one in the pipeline for that polytunnel, I promise. Um, but generally, it's because I just make stuff up as I go along. Um, 
I, do, I never really buy wood for anything. I've just got like anything I pull out of skip, which means if you're not actually just buying the materials for things, you don't tend to plan them beforehand. It tends to be like, well, I'm going to start with this one and then you just kind of like build onto it. So there's not really a master plan. Um, most of the cages that we've got at the allotment are just made with that uh, mesh, that steel mesh, which again was a freebie from a skip or while well, it wasn't from a skip, it was from a company that was closing down and they were throwing all of that out. So um, they're not built beds. They are literally just like a sheet that's been folded over the top of the bed. So the cage that the carrot root fly cage is made out of was some leftovers, um, pieces of wood that I had from a piece of sculpture that I made. Um, so I used a lot of that. But yeah, I will I will put some effort into actually going around and talking about um, the different cages I've got going on things. I'm going to make some more of those uh, carrot cages, so I will go through that. What have we got? Oh, I've got two questions, kind of similar. Um, Haw and Thorn and Betty and the Bees both asked about this room and what I do for a job. I um, I used to be a gardener. I did, went to Chelsea College of Art, then I went to the Barn Shaw School of Art, did sculpture. Then I went to the RHS College in Regent's Park and studied horticulture. Then I was a gardener for years and years and years. Um, and then I gave up being a gardener to go back to the Royal College of Art and do a master's in glass casting. Um, which is where I now work as a technician at the Royal College of Art um, doing mould making and bits and pieces like that but as you can imagine Covid has really changed the kind of technician's relationship with students because before it was very much hands-on um, somebody needs to make a mould of something I know how to make a mould of something and then we kind of work together to do it but everything's been really like removed and you can't work one-to-one -one with students and the number of students has been really reduced and everybody's really angry. <laughs> uh, it's not been that pleasant, to be honest, going back. So, uh, but we'll see what happens there. So going back to the question about YouTube, yes, I'd love to make a living doing this. Yeah, I would. Um, and the other question was from that same thing, is this what does she say? Uh, she's asking about this, the study I'm in. Uh, did I study art and design? Yes, I did. And are these my projects dotted around? They are bits of projects. Yeah, this is my, this is the back bedroom at home. I have got a workshop in my sister's garden, which is, you know, when I took you down there, one of those little buildings at the end is actually my workshop, but I haven't been able to get down there. Obviously this year, COVID restrictions, I haven't been able to travel backwards and forwards from down there. Um, but I'm hoping that this coming year I'm going to be able to go down there a lot more and get some work done. I've got a couple of kilns down there so I can get things done that I want to get done down there. So if I can get a situation together where I can get the allotment done, I can make videos, make some money from it, and then I can actually pursue what I want to do also in the studio. I mean, like I was saying with the education thing, I've, the two have kind of run in tandem always. Um, studying horticulture and studying sculpture so they kind of they come they come together i haven't done a show for the last show i did was in march this year so quite a long time ago but then that's another industry that's been really knocked out by covid yeah it's not looking bright on that front to be honest Okay, well, my phone just told me that uh, it's running out of space because I've been chatting too long. I've done frigatellos. It cut out me doing all the ab orange habaneros. I think during that time I was just chatting about. So what I'm going to do is just put it on here and we can go zzzz. Okay, that's a bit more like it. Um, another question was from Hannah's, which was five varieties on my no-no list. Well, obviously that asparagus pea I was talking about earlier is on there. There was also a runner bean that was called Benchmaster, which was just a complete disappointment. Um, you had to pick them so young um, for them to not be stringy that they then didn't have any flavour. Uh, and they just weren't prolific. They were just awful, basically. So that's a no-go. Peruvian white chilies. I won't bother with them again. They were just 
pretty nothingness really, not much flavour. In the tomatoes section, um, there's that Ildi, Idle, Idle, the one I talked about the other day, the little tiny yellow cherry uh, that's name is a bit too close to Idle and Audi for me to remember what it is, but that one, no flavour whatsoever and so prolific. Uh, awful, basically. Um, and then a bit of a controversial one. Last year I did a trial of Gardener's Delight, Isla Craig and Moneymaker, which are three like pretty bog standard, supposedly really good red tomatoes for people to grow. And I was so unimpressed with all of them. I'd sown all three because I was thinking, well, um, they look really similar, but uh, and they're all such good tomatoes. I'll just find out which one's best and go with that one from then on. But in the year, I grew so many other tomatoes that just outshone them by such a degree that uh, they are now on my no-no list. So, yeah. And I think that about finishes us off. OK, guys, that is my first round of chilies in. Thank you very much for joining me on this bit of a QA, and a bit of a chat and a bit of a silly... Uh, I was going to say a silly chowing, but I meant chilli sewing. I'm now going to take all of these and go and put them into the little heated propagator things that I've got downstairs, which are like just like a heated seed tray. Give them a really good water and uh, wait for them to germinate. If you want to see them set up in their kind of destination, uh, I'll put some pictures on Instagram this afternoon. Uh, yeah, here is to the new year. I'm going to cheers you with my pint of water. It's not very exciting, but it's better than nothing. And I really need it. So I hope you're all feeling much more sparkly than I am this morning. I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>